Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY, that's 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age and eligibility varies by jurisdiction. Void in New Hampshire, Oregon, and Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. For additional terms and responsible gaming resources, see dkng.co slash football. Welcome to Bear Bets, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Score big with DraftKings Sportsbook, the best place to bet touchdowns. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code BEARBETS. That's code BEARBETS for new customers to get $200 in bonus bets. It is me, Just Jeff Schwartz, today on the Bear Bets podcast. Our humble leader, Mr. Chris Felica, had a little bit of uh, transportation issues today, so just be me. We'll do a gambling group chat as usual. We'll hit the fade of the week and the best bets. We'll get you all covered for the National Football League starting with the game on Thursday night and then move into London and then all the games on Sunday and to Monday. The big news of the week in the National Football League is the Jets have fired head coach Robert Sala. They have uh, promoted their defensive coordinator to uh, the position of head coach and Nate Hackett, the offensive coordinator, is still there. The firing came a little bit out of the blue. Robert Sala was blindsided by it. No one really thought this was going to happen. The timeline as presented by by Craig Carden, who knows the Jets well. Uh, he mentioned from three different people that he spoke to. Um, there was discussion on uh, the day after the game or heading into to day two, basically, um, that Saul was going to take away play calling from Hackett. As we've seen over the years, Nate Hackett, the offense coordinator for the Jets, has never been good anywhere. I don't get it. He's Rogers' boy, though. That's why he has a job. And when you watch them play, as we saw evidence on the game in London, the problem was Aaron Rodgers in the offense. He sails a ball early. He throws a ball interception to, to end the game. Those are not Robert Sala problems. The, the Jets' defense has been just fine. So Robert Sala discussed taking away play calling dues from Hackett. It may have gone so far as to tell the staff that was the plan. But first, he had to let the owner and Andrew Rogers know about it. So the owner and Andrew Rogers speak on the phone. I believe this was on on Monday night. And they both claim, Rogers and, and ownership, that this was not a call about Robert Sala. It was a call just talking about the health of Aaron Rodgers, maybe the state of the team. It was not discussed whether or not that Sala was going to keep his job, the input from Aaron Rodgers. But you have to think, guys, that there's at least a discussion about that. Aaron Rodgers is your franchise quarterback. You have built the team around him. You've hired friends of his to be on the team. You hired his offensive coordinator. You kept Sala around after the season last year because of the relationship with, with Aaron Rodgers, the ownership. They speak on it. Again, reporting from, from Craig Carden, they speak on it. Uh, they decide not to fire Nate Hackett, and the next day, Robert Sala is fired when he comes to the building. He was not dragged out of the building, by the way, like like, like things a reporter. You know, he was allowed to gather his stuff and leave. Now, there, he was not allowed to talk to the team, which is a little unusual, but nonetheless, just move on to the next coach. I sort of get that. But the problem with the Jets, guys, a couple things. One, bad organizations, bad organizations stay bad, right? If you're going to fire a coach after five weeks, who, ironically enough, was sort of the favorite to be coach of the year, start the season, and maybe also had some good odds to be the first coach fired. Kind of funny how that both kind of plays together here, as he is the first coach fired. You're going to fire a coach after five games, you should have fired him in the offseason and started brand new. This does no, no one any good, right? Because the Jets' problem is not, now I don't think Robert Tull is a great head coach, by any means no one will accuse him of being that, but he can call a defense, right? When you're a head coach and you and you do one thing really well, it better be good, right? If you're a defensive guy, be good on defense. Your offense guy, be good on offense. Well, the thing he does well is defense. The team is good on defense. The problem is the offense. The problem is Nate Hackett. The problem is Rodgers being older off an injury and not playing terribly well compared to what we expect from Aaron Rodgers. Part of it is the personnel. Devontae Adams could be used. Doesn't mean that they need him per se, but Gary Wilson's calling out Nate Hackett. He's calling out the, 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 the things they're doing. They're not very imaginative. They're not really spreading the ball around the field very much. And Robert Sala gets canned for all this as the fall guy. Do I think Aaron Rodgers said specifically, you have to fire Robert Sala? No, I don't. I don't think that he went and during that phone call told Woody Johnson that 
Maybe Woody Johnson, and he has said this, the Jets owner, that he feels this is a team ready to win now, and this move was sort of to pre- preserve the season, which makes me think that maybe he thought that Robert Sala lost a locker room. There's no evidence of that. I don't see that from the way they play. I don't see less effort. I don't see less trying. I don't see bickering. Now, I know Rodgers and him had that little shoving session a couple weeks ago. That I don't know. Bo Nix and Sean Payne argued. I, coaches and players argue. They get It's a heated emotional game. I don't see much of an issue for that. But in the end, guys, bad organizations stay bad, and they're bad from, 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 from the top up. They don't know how to evaluate the issues at hand. The issue is not Robert Sala. He's a scapegoat for this issue. Is the offense is not good right now. And Nate Hackett has repeatedly shown every time he's offensive coordinator, his offenses are not good. And it's not going to change. I don't see much changing for the season right now. Yeah, maybe they go beat a Buffalo team this weekend on Monday night that's a little bit beat up right now because the, they're just Jets have more better football players with Buffalo struggling to pass the ball and play defense with, with some of their injuries. But the Jets right now, I think, are the outside looking for the postseason. It's going to end terribly. And if long as Nate Hackett is there, guys, they're not going to win a lot of football games, especially with their offense. All right, guys, gambling group chat time. It's going to be me, Will Hill, and John Murray. Stay tuned for that. Welcome again to the group chat. It is me, Jeff Schwartz, John Murray, and Will Hill. Before we get to the games, guys, just kind of general overview. These underdogs keep winning outright. It seems to be a trend in the NFL. John, do you expect this to continue this year? Is there is there a reason behind this? I'm sure you guys are happy with the sports book that these underdogs keep winning for you guys. I've never seen anything like it this year, Jeff. I mean, even, even last week, the top two picks in most survivor contests were Seattle at home against the New York Giants and San Francisco at home against the Arizona Cardinals. They both lost. So, I, I mean, I keep I keep thinking to myself, it has to end. And eventually, the favorites have to right the ship and start winning the way they're supposed to. I, I don't know. I think there's more parity in the league right now than there's ever been. I mean, it, uh, right now, most people would say the two best teams in the league are Kansas City and Minnesota. and They're both 5-0. and But they're, they both look very beatable at times, especially your Chiefs. So, I, I don't know. I, I think these underdogs are just going to keep surprising every week. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the the impact is is what we're seeing, and that is the lines are just going to be shorter. I mean, you look this week; it's a lot of two, three point lines. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't see these double digit spreads. We are getting upsets, but they're more in like the six, seven point range. I mean, I can remember, you know, every week you just look at the highest spread. There was ten, sometimes fourteen. I remember I think it was a Jacksonville Denver game when like Peyton Manning was at the the height of his powers with Denver, and that line was like twenty eight, and that was like a decade ago. We just we're not going to see anything <laughs> like that anymore. And I believe Denver covered. I have to go back and find that game. Yeah, it's just it's a league of parity. It, it's always been the uh, the saying. It's an eight and eight league where if you catch a couple breaks, you're a couple games over. If you don't catch some breaks, you're a couple games under. But this league is very, I would say, squished together where um, th- there's just a lot of balance, a lot of parity. It makes it very hard to handicap, but it uh, I guess it makes it good from the books standpoint. Uh, these teasers haven't been doing well, especially if you're teasing the favorites, but maybe you just no. you have to get out of this mode where you're teasing the favorites and these two and a half point dogs. Maybe you tease them up and you go that way because these games tend to be close, but definitely a, a league here that that's wide open. And man, uh, you mentioned it, Minnesota five and all just uh, who would have thought that? Well, are you getting a little bit excited as a Vikings fan? Is there a little bit of excitement creeping in? Or are you still just a, a, a little dread there? Uh, both. Both. I mean, we all know how this ends, and that is with an absolute gut punch of a loss come postseason time. But you got to enjoy the ride. And uh, I don't know if we'll get to it. DraftKings has these markets up. They're plus 200 to be the one seed. They're the short shot. And I'm like, man, that's crazy. They're really going to be the one seed. But you look around. Detroit's got a really tough schedule. They play at the Texans, at the Bills. They play the Packers twice, the Vikings twice. Um, Boy, Minnesota's got a pretty soft schedule going forward. And they've got a nice little lead over everybody where one game over Detroit. Detroit could ever lose this weekend. Boy, it's not like baseball where you play 162 of these games. Only a dozen games left. Minnesota being the one seed is a very, very real possibility. Let's get into to Thursday Night Football now. Uh, Seattle hosting San Francisco. Seattle, uh, three-and-a-half point dog, total of 49. Will, you talked about teasers. This feels like a Seattle teaser leg, right? Get them up to, to nine-and-a-half. Maybe there's a, a little movement up to ten at some point. But I don't really know how else to play this one because both teams are not playing their best football, right? Seattle's lost two in a row. Niners just lost the Cardinals in a game they should have won. We we had, I think, the team total over all of us on the show last week for oh. the Niners, and that didn't get home. It wasn't even close to getting home. 
Yeah, well, I mean, they had 23 points in the first half, and I was ready to just, you know, see the money hit my account. And then the kicker got hurt, and the game got weird. This is this is two times in three weeks that they've just had these losses where uh, you, you scratch your head in terms of how they gave them away. I remember, it was a couple weeks ago against the Rams where that game was all but over. They lose that. And then this one against Arizona, something seems off with San Francisco. It's still a super talented team. But with the injuries with McCaffrey, the holdouts, I don't know if it's the Super Bowl hangover. I don't know if it's a confluence of all of these things, but – they're two and three. They need this game desperately because they have the Chiefs on deck. Like them losing this game and being two and five in ten days is not insane. And as good as they are, two and five is going to be a hard hill to climb. I wouldn't count San Francisco out. I would lean San Francisco in the in this game. I just think they're the more talented football team. Seattle got dominated from start to finish uh, last week against the Giants. Uh, I'm curious what you think, Jeff, as a, a former player. This is Mike McDonald's first time as a a coach on short rest. Is that hard to prep for your first time? Is that a factor in your handicap? It'd be a lean to the 49ers, but man, laying points on the road in this league is just not something I'm going to do. It's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's his first time doing it. Now, I would imagine the coach that he is, he is probably prepped for this, right? All offseason, sort of, it's early in the season enough to sort of have a general idea. It's a division game, but he hasn't played his, his, his division opponent yet. So I'd imagine that, yes, he's probably maybe less quote-unquote, prepared than Shanahan would be for this moment, but I'm not sure it matters terribly much to a handicap the situation, John. Well, I can tell you that the way this game is being bet by the players we respect, they're on the dog. They're taking Seattle plus the three and a half. Both these teams are off bad losses. Yeah. Seattle looked really bad on Sunday. Seattle should have lost that game to the Giants by a lot more than they did. The only reason that game was even close was the Giants fumbled going into the end zone. Seattle returned at 100 yards for a touchdown. Or that probably would have been a blowout for the Giants. I guess you could you could take the optimistic outlook and say that Seattle was looking ahead to this Thursday night game mm. in San Francisco, and that's why they played so poorly on Sunday. But I think there's some real problems with this Seattle team. Maybe a get-right spot here for the 49ers. I still think the 49ers are the best team in the NFC, them and, them and the Lions. I mean, Seattle played Bo Nix in his first start. Then went to New England, and and that was in was that an overtime game, right? They won that game by thirty. Yes. England's not good. They played Dolphins with with no Tua, and then they played a really good Lions team, and they kind of got reset. And the, the Giants are punchy. I mean, they're not talented, but they they play hard with Brian Dable. I just, I just don't think Seattle is that good. But the Niners aren't playing their best football right now either. So I think it's it's Seattle or pass. Let's get to the game uh, in London. Here it is the first of our two Super Six games for the week, sponsored by DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now. It is Chicago favored by two, the total of 44 and a half. Uh, John, I'm going to start with you here. We have mm -hmm. seen a lot of favorites win outright, cover win outright in these international games. Is that a trend worth monitoring here, or is that just sort of happenstance? I mean, there's been 45 of these games now, so it's not really a small sample size anymore. I know this is a gambling show. Am I allowed to say that I don't want to gamble on or watch any more of these London games? Yes. I mean, I every... Yes. Every season, I say I say to myself, okay, just don't worry about the, the London games. Just ignore them. Don't be an idiot. And then I go out and I played the Jets last week in the, the big contest in, in, in Las Vegas, which I am in, and I lost. Of course, I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to predict this game. I can tell you this. I can just report this to you guys. Really sharp account bet Bears minus two. Okay. And a, ver a very respected syndicate that over 43, Jacksonville, Chicago. My my game plan for Sunday morning is to pretend that the game is not going on <laughs> and not watch it. I'll come into work probably a little before halftime. I'll watch the end of it in my office, but I'm not going to get involved. I I'm, I'm waving the white flag on these international games, guys. I like Jacksonville in this spot. I think that, I mean, this is kind of their home away from home. We talk about routines with Mike McDonald, first-year head coach. Is he going to be ready for the Thursday night thing? Jacksonville's going to be ready for this trip, and this trip is a different animal. Uh, they've done this a bunch of times. I think this is one of these scenarios where they stay there back-to-back -back weeks. So they've got this trip down pat. They've been there before. They've done well on these trips. And uh, if you look at Chicago's wins, last week was a, was a thorough win, a convincing win. Granted, it was against Carolina. But their other wins, the Rams kind of played them. 
evenly. I think the Rams outgained them, out first downed them. That win against the Titans, remember, week one was the total fluke where Levis just threw the game away, and the Titans should have won. Bears only had a couple, like 2.2 yards per play, I think it was. So uh, I, I could see Jacksonville in the spot. I, I will take the two and a half. I think this is a good teaser leg uh, if you find a dance partner because you tease Jacksonville up to eight and a half, and you just say, hey, if the Bears win by double digits, you beat me, you beat me. I just think this will be a close football game, and uh, I, I would go with Jacksonville here. All Jaguar games feel close because their defense yes. is terrible. Like their 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 defense. I mean, look, I, I don't want to complain about last week, but I, I had Jacksonville minus three, and they're up thirty four twenty guys, and two minutes later it's thirty four thirty four. Like they continue to do each and every game feels like this, right? Where they're sort of in the game and they're not in the game, and the Bears are playing better right now, right? Caleb Williams is doing a better job. The defense is sort of picking up a little bit. The offensive line has played better to Will. That's what I'm concerned about Jacksonville here. Now, the 8.5, I think, on the teaser leg is good is a good way to play this, but are you concerned at all that Jacksonville keeps doing this? It's sort of the same routine. Start fast, and then you watch them play, and you're like, why are you not winning this game by more? Sure. But with the teaser, all you want is to, for the game to be close. And uh, you mentioned Caleb Williams playing better, which I think, look, is good good for the league that Caleb Williams, Daniels, Knicks has played better. Yeah. I think the theme early on in the season was, man, these rookie quarterbacks are all struggling. Good for the league because, I mean, everyone knows we need better quarterback play. And it's, <laughs> you know, I'm John, I'm sure for John, it's good for business that people are watching yeah. these games, high scoring games. Last week, we had a bunch of games in the 50s. So I, I think good all around these quarterbacks are starting to make a little bit of a leap. Look, there's no surprise, by the way. It just is reps. That's all it is. You know, yeah. we talked earlier in the season about the cover two and all this stuff that's happened. Yeah, defenses tend to be ahead. We often just don't practice. We don't practice anymore. It's a big gripe of mine, right? Now, I don't want to be the old head who's like, we need two days to come back. We don't need that. But there's no practice. They practice three times to take a day off in training camp. They're barely in pads. Defenses are way ahead. I think we're seeing last week, especially, guys, uh, the offenses sort of start taking back some of that. Plus, injuries are starting to play a major role in some of these defenses, right? As, as guys get hurt, uh, there's just no depth. And I think we're seeing that as part of the reason why some teams defensively are just really struggling right now. And one of those teams could be the Dallas Cowboys. They're hosting the Detroit Lions. Detroit favored by three here. A uh, total is, is high. Uh, it is 52, 52 and a half here. This is also uh, a Super 6 game for us, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Lions to win by four points or more. Our Cowboys to win, lose, or tie by three points or fewer is our question. Uh, Will, we'll start with you here. Uh, I very much enjoy the Lions team total in this game. You look at the Cowboys injuries up front with Parsons and Lawrence. They said Parsons is game time. Feels less likely he's going to play. Bland might be back, though, for them. The Steelers couldn't take advantage of this. The Lions are off a bye. I think the Lions score a lot of points in this game. I like that pick. Uh, I'm curious what number you got because I think both these teams... Half. Yeah, I think both these teams could flirt with 30. I actually like Dallas getting the three just because I think this is kind of last team with the ball kind of game. I do think Dallas will have success through the air. This is still a Detroit secondary that you can have them, you can get them, and the Dak to Lamb combination will uh will have some success here. So to me, this is yeah, 31, 28, uh, you know, 27, 24, last team with the ball. I think both teams will move the ball. Dallas has the the ultimate weapon in the kicker. So indoors, once you get the let's just say you get the touchback, you started at 30. I mean, you're basically, you know, you, you get four or five yards and you're in field. Field goal range. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Dallas put the up, pulled the upset, but to me, a field goal game either way, back toward cover. You know, if you're down 10, you can maybe get a push with Dallas that way. I, I would take Dallas here plus the three. I think I'm very interested in this game, and I'll tell you why, because I know Dallas is very banged up defensively, but it's still interesting to me to see Detroit as a three-point favorite on the road. It really shows you how highly power-rated the Lions are right now. Maybe the probably the highest power rated team in the NFC. And that's how our, our sharp guy did betting. We, we took money on Detroit minus the three in this game. Uh, uh, very interesting to see this game. I agree with Will. I kind of like Dallas here. Dallas was able to beat Pittsburgh last week on the road, even with all their injuries on defense. Maybe they get some guys back this week. I, I was surprised to see not only Detroit be this big of a favorite on the road, but to see the players betting the Lions in this spot, very interesting to me. It says a lot about how highly regarded the Detroit Lions are right now. Are, are they your favorite to win the NFC? Because if you look at the NFC right now, look, it's Minnesota 5-0, and uh, Commanders mm -hmm. 4-1. We'll talk about them in a second. Lions, Falcons, Seahawks, Tampa Bay, Dallas, Green Bay, Chicago kind of all clustered at 3-2 and two there. And then we have the Eagles and the Saints and the Cardinals. 
I don't know who my favorite would be. I think I would lean Detroit. I had Detroit, Kansas City as my Super Bowl t- as my Super Bowl pick. Um, but not I don't feel comfortable with really any NFC team right now. I mean, the Vikings are playing great, and they will probably be the one or two seed just based off of who they have left. I don't think the Commanders are winning the NFC. John, are the Lions still sort of your favorite to win the NFC? I, I think you, I think you still have to point to San Francisco because if they get everybody healthy again, they they should be the best team. But Detroit's going to have the easier should have the easier path. I don't. I'm. I'm just going to keep doubting Minnesota. You know, I mentioned that I, I bet I was against them on Sunday morning when they played in London. So I'll just keep doubting them all the way into January, and they can just make me look like a fool every week for the next fifteen or so weeks. I look. I didn't like Minnesota coming into the season. I recognize that they're a very, very, very well coached team. There's no doubt about that. But I didn't think they had the horses to be anywhere close to the top of the NFC. So I'm just going to keep going down with that opinion. And I'll point to, <laughs> I'll point to the Lions and the 49ers as the best teams in the NFC. Well, Vikings slander so early in the morning. Look, I, n- nobody has slandered the Vikings more than me, so I can understand it. And until like a couple weeks ago, I was like, oh, this is a cute story. I expected, I was optimistic. And I, I think on one of the shows this summer, I said, you know what? Maybe division, hey, they're well coached. Division can be wide open. You win it with like 10 games. I never thought this. Nobody thought this. Uh, and that being said, I've come around. Now, Donald didn't play well last week. He got hit early, and I, I thought he was very erratic after that. But again, with only one bye, that one seed is so huge. And at 5-0, and oh, they've got a leg up over everybody. I'm just, I'm looking at this Detroit schedule at Dallas, at Houston, the Bills, uh, at the 49ers, or is that game? Yeah, they play at the 49ers. I mean, this is a brutal, oh, yeah. brutal schedule for Detroit, and if Minnesota gets the one, I mean, what is that path to the Super Bowl? It's win one home game, and you're in the NFC title game at home, so I don't think Minnesota's the best team, but if they can just kind of split their games with Detroit, and they play Detroit next week, which is going to be a monster game in Minnesota, Minnesota on the look headlines, a point and a half favorite, the path is there for at least Minnesota to have a leg up and be the one seed. Let's get to a, a pretty fascinating game here. Washington at Baltimore. Baltimore, six and a half point favorite, total 51 now at DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, John, I, I got a question on, on this one. So if you just would have, I think, asked us what this number would have been, I don't think any of us would have had six and a half, right? With with the way commanders are playing, they've won four in a row. They're four and one offensively. Great so far. Running the ball well. Daniels is playing now. Defense is suspect. Baltimore's played better lately, right? That Raiders loss looks pretty bad, but otherwise they've sort of handled business. Kind of, you know, maybe shouldn't have won last week, but won, right? That's the NFL. They played to the very end and, and the Bengals messed it up. Is this a sign, six and a half, telling you that Baltimore is the right side here? I always feel like when the sports books are sort of telling us this number is different <laughs> than what we think. Maybe that's yeah. the direction to go here. Well, you know, I've, I've downplayed these numbers because I, I think that they're overrated and I think they're mostly for entertainment purposes. But I will tell you guys that our ticket count on this game is very, very slanted to the dog. You know, you're, you're talking about three to one tickets on Washington. Wow. And that's very interesting when you're talking about a six and a half point road underdog, a team that has a rookie quarterback. I think the reason why this line is so high is very simple. I think it's because Baltimore is considered to be the best team in the NFL right now. I think they are the best team in the NFL right now. That's why they are they were laying points last week against the Bengals on the road, a game that the Bengals should have won. I know. That they only lost. That game Ugh. really hurt them. I know, like, I'm sure this is going to break hearts for all the people watching the show, but that game was really bad for the sports book at the West <laughs> I mean, we were we were all – the 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 expletives were flying – as the as the Bengals, the Bengals who had moved the ball at will the whole game, decided, hey, we're good. Let's just settle for this 53-yard field goal. Let's not try to get any closer. Let's just – I don't know what the hell they were thinking, but that, that game crushed us. But Baltimore was favored in that game on the road. They were favored on the road at Dallas a couple weeks ago. I, I think they're considered the best team in the league. That's why they're such a big favorite. And the public is on Washington. So, Will, do what you want with that information. I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, usually who the public's on, uh, you know, who the squares are on, who the sharps, like this, 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 the, the, you know, quote unquote squares win plenty of times too. So I try not to pay too much attention to that. Uh, I will say my favorite bet in this game, and I'm not, I don't have an appetite for laying points in this league, laying six and a half. It's just, man, it's just, it's not a good league to lay points in. Uh, but Jeff, to your point, you, you had Dallas team total or, or Detroit team total earlier on that game over. I'm looking now 29 and a half 
over under for the Ravens total points. I mean, I think Baltimore gets in the thirties here because uh, and I'm not a huge trends guy, but Lamar against the NFC has yeah. been one that's been profitable, which makes sense because he's kind of an oddball player. If you don't see him, if you only see him once every, you know, three or so years, he's a hard guy to defend. He's, he's a unique skill set. So to me, the Ravens get in the thirties here. My favorite bet is Ravens team total over 29 and a half points. At some point, Washington, this defense is going to get exposed. Well, I mean, it sort of has. I mean, the, the Bengals scored a lot of points. Their defense just is not very good. Yeah. The problem is they haven't sort of played. The Browns The Browns are the worst scoring situation in the NFL. Like They can't do anything about – they couldn't score at all. They moved the ball a little bit. But also, too, remember, though, when, when you're playing against the Browns – we're not. this is not a Browns you know, preview, but when they go three and out six times in a row, your defense is going to be worse, right? And Washington was able to take advantage of a tired Browns defense because they're always on the field. So I'm with you guys. I mean, Washington's efficiency on defense is 24th. I mean, they they just haven't faced a team recently like Baltimore, who, as John put, the number one in the NFL in, in, uh, in overall efficiency. They're playing good ball, even though uh, they're they're three and two right now. Uh, by the way, underdogs uh, 16, uh, excuse me, 19, six and one against the spread this season, five points or more. Uh, the public's all over. The commanders there. Let's get to another NFC game here. A fascinating one. We have Tampa Bay on the road against New Orleans. That number is three and a half for Tampa Bay. They're favored by three and a half total. 41 and a half now at DraftKings. Spencer Rattler in for Derek Carr here. Uh, John, a sportsbook adjustment at all with the news that Carr was not playing. I know it was pretty much known. I yeah. think he wasn't going to play. Uh, I don't think it changed very much with the actual announcement that Rattler was going to be in there. Well, I think the my question would be: Are you telling me that New Orleans really doesn't have a better option than Spencer Rattler? And if if that's their best option, I mean, what were they doing all off season? I mean, like I uh, some of these teams, like I look at the Miami Dolphins, you've got a quarterback in Tua Tagovailoa, you know he's injury prone, you yeah. know he's probably not going to start 17 games for you. How do you not invest in a backup quarterback the way we saw the Indianapolis Colts do with Joe Flacco, New Orleans? They don't. I guess they don't have a backup QB. They didn't have a backup plan if Derek Carr got hurt, or was the backup plan Taysom Hill, who's also uh, hurt? Yeah. I, I don't know exactly. Jake Hainer? Isn't isn't Jake Hainer on the roster? Or is he the Jake Hainer is who came in at the end of the Kansas City game yeah. on Monday night. So yeah. he he looked lost in that game. This number went from from Tampa Bay plus two and a half to Tampa Bay minus three and a half. So a pretty big move going crossing through the zero. We're, I'm sure we're going to need New Orleans because the public is going to love this opportunity to bet against Spencer Rattler. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident in that. Yeah, I would actually take the points, if anything. I know it's yeah. ugly, and Rattler, look, he wasn't even that impressive in college, but man, Derek Carr <laughs> wasn't that great the other night, and we're going to move the line like a touchdown because of Derek Carr. Sometimes these teams, what, what do they call it, the fallen hero theory, where everyone, uh, quarterbacks hurt, and everyone knows we got to raise our level of play. Defense has to play better. Offensive line has to play better, and you get that bump for a game. That doesn't always last, and sometimes yeah. two or three games later, all right, comes back down to earth, but sometimes these teams come out fired up when they don't have their quarterback. I see it in the NBA a lot, where you know they, they rest mm -hmm. their top two guys, and you look up, and the team won by 20 points. Say, how did that happen? Well, everybody raises their game. The other team kind of relaxed, so maybe that's one of these scenarios. It'd, it'd be the, the dog or nothing for me, Jeff. Uh, I, I will say, I, I agree with that sort of bump we see sometimes with backup quarterbacks. The problem is the Saints offensive line is really bad. It is. And I, I don't think you can count on that in this game because if, if Rattler gets hit early, like that's it. With, with young quarterbacks, you got to protect them very early in the game so they feel very comfortable. If, if Vita Vea gets going in that pass rush for Tampa Bay, I think Rattler could go in the tank pretty fast. Now, he does allow them a little bit of more mobility, things they can do. Like, if Taysom Hill's out again, you can sort of use Rattler as that running quarterback at times and sort of muck up a game. But if it gets into a situation where he has to pass the football, uh, with that offensive line, we saw last weekend uh, Chris Jones and the Chiefs defense did, uh, did a number on them. Um, all right, speaking about uh, maybe a, a bump in a game with a coach firing, the Bills are at the Jets. Uh, the Bills are two nine point favorites. The total of that game is forty one right now. Um, Will no Robert Sala, Nate Hackett's still there. Albright's the coach now. Does this change the Jet season at all? I'm not sure. Uh, speaking of bumps, sometimes we do see this where the if they fire the coach and they get that initial bump where everybody plays a little harder, everyone's on notice. I would have liked Hackett to go too because they just, man, they don't look well coached on either side of the ball. No. I, I don't know why you kept the same play caller. Um, th th this interim Ulbrich is a guy that everyone seems to respect. So, be a lean towards the Jets, but man, the, the problem with the Jets, they just there's no like continuity on offense. Everyone just looks like they're 
on different pages. There was a play late in the game where the Jets are about to steal the game and score. Wilson streaking up the right sideline, and, and Rodgers throws it a different way. And they're just they're never on the same page. I don't know. Like eventually, Adams is going to get traded at some point. We keep saying they're hearing it's at every day or uh, any day now, but that any day never seems to come. It'd be a lean towards the Jets as bad as things are for the Jets. You win this game somehow. You're in first place. It's just Rodgers can't seem to move. Like he he looked good that Thursday night two or three weeks ago, but then he got hurt against Denver. He got hit again, again last week where dealing with a knee, dealing with an ankle, and he just doesn't have that escapability. And teams are going to blitz him. They can't run the ball. So there's not a lot to like about this Jets team. If you're betting the Jets here, John, you're just saying, hey, the new coach is going to give him a bump, and this team's going to look different on Monday night. I'm not so sure. Well, you know, Aaron Rodgers is an old man, guys. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is like my age. So we can't, you can't expect him to be running around in the pocket the way he used to when he was at Green Bay, running for first downs. I don't think that's realistic. I think we should all aspire to have the job security that Nathaniel Hackett has. I, uh, I don't know how that, how that guy got another job after the situation in Denver, and, and then he didn't get fired when his head coach got fired. I don't think that Robert Salah was – the problem with the New York Jets. I'll tell you guys that much right now. But I can tell you that we did see some sharp money come in on the Jets plus three. Moved us to Buffalo minus two and a half. And I get it. I mean, there's a chance. We talked about the bump maybe for New Orleans going to the back of quarterback. If the if the interim coach of the Jets is a guy that the players rally behind, that they support, that they like, you might see them rally to, to his cause. And Buffalo is a team... We mentioned the Bengals. I was very upset with Zach Taylor at the end of the Bengals game, but Buffalo blew their game. Yes. They blew that game to Houston. And Sean McDermott has he, sneakily, we don't talk about it much, but he's got a history of boneheaded decisions yeah, at the does. end of close games. Yeah, it cost them that AFC yeah. divisional game against Jeff's Chiefs a few years ago, where all they had to do was do a squib kick. And they would have hosted the yeah. AFC championship game the next season. McDermott's done this before. I understand why the sharp guys are on New York in this spot because you know Buffalo's in a really tough spot in their schedule right now, and the Jets maybe this sets up perfectly for the Jets coming home from London, playing for the new coach at home, getting into first place behind the aforementioned Nathaniel Hacks. Jeff, have you watched? Yeah. Have you watched the Bills on film, Jeff? Because I've heard some film guys on Twitter say, "Hey, they're playing Buffalo differently. They're playing more man and just daring these kind of yes. mediocre Bills receivers to beat them. It yeah. allows the, you to do a better job on Allen. Is that is there some truth yes. to that? I'm glad you mentioned that because um, the Bills wide receiving core is not good to start with, right? And then they're hurt, right? Shakir didn't play last week. Mm-hmm. I don't know his status as of right now. I mean, it, it, look, it was it ended up being 23-20 win for, for the Texans. Guys, Al, Allen was 9 of 30 for 131 yards. Amazing. And it wasn't like there was a lot of open guys that were dropping passes too, right? So when, when, you can, when you can play man, that gives you one extra guy in the box, presumably for Josh Allen, but also gives you more guys in the box to stop the run. And Buffalo started to run the ball better, but now you have more guys to defend. So yes, it's a huge problem. It's also a third straight road game. John mentioned their schedule. That's that's taxing. I know it's not a long trip from Buffalo down to uh to um, you know, to where the to East Rutherford there, but it's still the third game in a row. And they played the Ravens, and they went and played the Texans and the Jets now. So three straight road games. Injuries on defense aren't helping. You have injuries on offense, and I think it's Jets or pass here, which I will pass. I will not have the Jets in this game um, because that I just their offense right now. John mentioned like the Dave Hackett thing, and I talked about this at, at the start of the show. Um, He's the problem. He's the problem everywhere. He's never been a good offensive coordinator. Like one year in Jacksonville, the year they went in 2017, they, they went to New England and had that playoff game. Like they were the 17th best offense in the NFL that season. And that was his best year as offensive coordinator. I, I don't get it, guys. I would stay away from the Jets in this game, but that'd be the side or pass. Will, anything else you like this week? Anything that'll make your card? I think I'm going back to the well with the Titans, famous last words. I've actually, <laughs> I bet them a few times. Uh, it hasn't worked out for me. I think it's a good spot. They're off of a bye. Indy is, first of all, really bad on defense, but they're beat up. Taylor and Pittman, I don't know who's playing quarterback. I think for my the sake of my Titans bet, I'd actually prefer Richardson because as bad as Levis has been, Richardson hasn't been much better. So I think this is a good spot for a Titan team that I actually think is underrated. This could easily be you know a 3-2 and two team if Levis didn't just sabotage these games single-handedly. Maybe if he makes a mistake early, it's Rudolph. I'd prefer Rudolph to play for Tennessee, but I'll uh, I'll lay the two or so here with the Titans, John. 
I think I like Baltimore this week, guys. I mean, I'm still kind of, I'm still sort of looking through all the games. I'm still figuring out. I got, I got so much anxiety, Jeff, because I'm in these survivor contests. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat trying to figure out what to do here. It's Plus the fun. Tigers. It's two, and the Tigers are up two games to one. Yeah. So I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I got too much going on right now, but I, an early look, I think Baltimore may be, I think Washington has a reality check on Sunday. I know Washington's playing very well. Washington's really improved their coaching staff. I think that might be something that isn't being talked about enough. Everybody's talking about Jaden Daniels, and I get that, but they really improved their their overall coaching staff. They look like a real NFL franchise, which hasn't been the case in a long time. Not not necessarily with their uniform. Their uniforms look ridiculous, but they play <laughs> like an actual NFL franchise. I got to give them credit. But I think maybe Baltimore gives them a dose of reality on Sunday. Um, I, uh, I, I'm i with you on that. I, I will have Baltimore. So, t- John, you said before we got on 221 mm-hmm. uh, contestants left in, in Circa Survivor. Um, yeah. You're one of them, right? You have How many entries do you have left? Yeah. I, well, I have one. I do have I do have a partner. Uh, you guys probably know Kelly in yes. Vegas on Twitter. Very outspoken uh, partner of mine. We, we did use Kansas City on Monday night because the thought process there was everybody's saving Kansas City and only six people use them. Now, the problem is now we don't have Kansas City moving forward, which is tough. We are still alive. Probably going to use Philadelphia. Okay. They are at home against Cleveland. Philadelphia's off a of bye. It looks like they're getting healthy. But every time we look at this thing and we say, let's just use so-and-so and get to next week. Well, so-and-so loses <laughs> yeah. or or their, their life and death. So I know it's not going to be easy, but as somebody that in the other circuit contest had Cleveland the last two weeks, lost both times – by the way, um, I'd be happy to root against Deshaun Watson on Sunday yeah. instead of rooting for him. I think that's a better role for me to go against Deshaun Watson. Yeah. He looks just lost. It doesn't even begin to describe it, guys. Uh, the, the bartender and Marge were both on the Commanders <laughs> last weekend, so I, I was on. Uh, yeah. I was on Cleveland too, guys. It was a rough. It was uh, a rough fade. The fade did oof. not go quite as I uh, wanted it to go. Yeah. Um, so, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us. We'll talk to you guys next Thursday. Thank you. Sounds Thanks, good. Guys. All right, guys, we're back from Gambling Goop Chat. Thank you to to John and Will for joining us. Uh, 14,000, uh, over 14,000 people were in that, in that Survivor Contest, 221 left. So good luck to, to John on that this week. If you're still in a Survivor Contest, uh, good luck to you. I, I know we give you guys Survivor picks. I'm terrible at it, and Bear's not here, and that's Bear's job. So I'm going to let that one pass. We'll go to my, my fade of the week here. Uh, we're going to fade offense in Denver this weekend. The Chargers off a of bye at the Broncos here. The total is 35 and a half. I'm not worried about it. I'm taking the under in this game. Let's talk about these offenses. Now, Bo Nix has done better for the Broncos the last couple of weeks. They got up to three wins now, but the offense is not scoring a lot of points. Only 6% of the Broncos drives into touchdowns, second worst in the NFL. 53% of their drives even gained one first down. Guess what? Second worst in the NFL. They also punt on 24% of their drives. Guess what? Second worst in the NFL. Guess who's worse than the NFL? The Chargers. 52% of the drives get, get, uh, get, get, get a first down. 26% of the drives ended punts. The Chargers, I believe, are getting their tackles back. But both these defenses on these teams, guys, are very good. They're really good. They're first and second in defensive points allowed. They're second in DVOA for the Chargers. Broncos are fourth, uh, allowing under 15 points a game are both these teams. So I think we see a defensive game. Just and, and the way that these teams want to operate offensively, right? It's sort of protect your quarterback, which you shouldn't have to do with Herbert, but that's the way the Chargers feel. Run the football with Harbaugh. Run the football with Payton. Both both coaches subscribe to the idea, at least right now, that ending a drive and a kick is a positive, which means a punt or a field goal or a PAT, of course. So give me the under here. Low total. We're fading offense uh, under 35 and a half. All right, let's get to our best bets presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Bear is not here. He's stuck on the side of the road, but I'm going to give you guys his best bets for Thursday Night Football. It's Niners minus three and a half. That's it. I don't have a reason. Bear's not here. <laughs> he said uh, best bet here, minus three and a half. Uh, my best bet presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, and we finally got in the, in the, in the win column last week, guys. It's been a little bit rough for the best bet. We had we lost three. We had, we had a tie. We pushed, and we won last weekend. Let's go Packers here. Team total over 
26 and a half. Jordan Love has come back. The Packers offense has sort of reignited itself. We saw the 29 points against the Vikings. Only 24 last weekend, but there were sort of plays to, to still be had. But guys, Arizona's defense allows a lot of points. 25.8 uh, per game. They're not very good efficiency-wise. And they're sort of back on the road again after a big win. So it's sort of like a, a, a best bet with a lot of points for the Packers. But also maybe a fade of the Cardinals off a big win. The Niners had 23 points the first half of that game and were not able to do much more, which is which is kind of surprising. The Niners should have won that game. They didn't. No second half points. So give me the Packers here. Over 26 and a half points uh, is my is my uh, my best bet presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. And that's it, guys. We did it. We did the game of group chat. Gave you a little bit of Jets. Gave you our best bets. A fade of the week. We'll be back next week to talk college football and then the NFL. Have a great weekend of wagering, everyone. Take care.